cool. You can see the nice markings. These guys are eating two to three times a week. Can they eat a venomous snake? Their favorite flavor of uh, snakes <laughs> are um, venomous snakes. What's going on everyone? I am hanging out here at the Orient Center for Indigo Conservation. You may have heard of these guys. You may also remember Trevor hey here from St. Augustine Alligator Farm and we're meeting Dr. James Bogan, uh, who is the director of this center here and you work very, very much uh, with the Central Florida Zoo. Uh, and the whole purpose is to make sure that we continue to have indigo snakes in the wild, uh, which is a really amazing uh, job. So thanks for doing that. And I also want to shout out the fact that we've gonna, we're gonna have some news to announce here. Yeah. Um, we're following up because, you know, we were at St. Augustine, we actually did a fundraiser. You guys did the Raptor Run and you raised how much money? So in total, we raised a little over $10,000. That is really cool. And then you guys helped us out, my friend Matt Nelesnik and I, as we did the 12 Hours of Santos mountain bike race, we raised another $3,000. So it's the most raised for Indigo uh, Conservation and the money is going to you. Thank you so much. No, Thank our you. pleasure, man. This is really cool. We wanted to do something, obviously, you know, you're a zoological institution, but I want this channel to be more about uh, action and, you know, giving back to the animals that have given me fascination and have given me basically a life. Uh, if you can believe it, Doc, I actually get to do this for a living. Uh, so it's a dream come true for That's me. Awesome. It's pretty cool. We're inside this, this room here. Can you explain to everyone what this room is all about? So this is the, our herpetarium. So this is where all of our um, snakes are housed or the main ones that are part of the reintroduction program. We have everything from our breeding adults to um, juveniles that are not yet uh, old enough to be part of the breeding program, but will awesome. eventually be uh, there. Yeah. Cool. And you actually have an animal we can actually get a, get a look at and have a, yeah. have a you, I want you to explain to everyone, you know, this is such a process, huh? Like everything is really formulaic. Uh, and that is so you know the health of the animal, when the animal's eaten, uh, if it's been worked on or not. So there's kind of a rhythm to the caging here. That's correct. So we do have each group separated and, and you know, indigo snakes are ophiophagus, so we have to house them individually because uh, ophiophagus means eating snakes, right? And so we don't want them to eat each other, <laughs> so we have to keep them separated and we keep them in their own individual um, habitats. Between each habitat, we make sure we try to keep things as, as clean as possible. We'll either thoroughly wash our hands between each um, habitat or we'll wear uh, disposable gloves. And when the keepers are going through and, and doing their husbandry, it's more efficient to wear the gloves and change gloves between, because if you're doing a washing your hands of five to 10 minutes, you, it would take you forever to right. get through all these And guys. you might seem OCD a little bit, yeah. you know? <laughs> the, the exactly. impulsive washing of the hands, but you know, there's such uh, the potential for these animals to get sick. So that's why you have to be kind of, I wouldn't say neurotic, but you have to be formulaic in the way that you go about this. Correct, you have to be on top of it. Okay. So we're gonna take a look here at 90. He's one of our big males that have, that's been here for uh, years and years and years. So beautiful. And you know, the thing about the indigo snakes here, and Trevor, jump in at any point, because I know this is, you yeah. love these snakes. Um, when I look at an indigo snake, they, would they be considered a colubrid? Are they a colubrid? They are colubrids, Okay, yes. for me, you know, I, I just look at that. They have the look of another Ophiophagus snake. They, they kind of look like a, a king cobra that hasn't spread its hood. <laughs> and why I say that is if you look at the eyebrow scale, I always call it an eyebrow. Right. It's not an eyebrow, but it's a, a, I'm sure there's a real name for the scale on top. Superocular. There you go, superocular scale. They kind of have that aggressive look. They really do. And that anytime I see a cobra, they also have that same kind of furrowed look, like mm, I'm intense. Um, beautiful snake. This is the one of the largest snakes in North America. It is the um, longest 
native species to North America. To North, even bigger than the uh, Eastern Diamondback. Yeah, lengthwise, not necessarily body weight, but lengthwise, sure. Okay, very yeah. cool. Now these guys, you know, as you said, they're a Pheophagus, so they're gonna be eating, what, can they eat a venomous snake? Yeah, that's actually, you know, their favorite flavor of uh, snakes <laughs> are um, venomous snakes. Wow, so that's yeah. intense. Yeah. Copperheads are their, their preferred um, venomous snake, but they'll actually eat uh, copperheads, they'll eat uh, eastern diamondbacks. That's um, incredible. Are they immune to the venom? They have resistance to the venom. Yeah, we've well, documented that here. You have? Yeah, we've, done, we've worked with um, universities that have done uh, studies with... Um, uh, not actually having the snakes bit, right? Of but taking their blood and uh, doing um, uh, venom. Uh, like antibody type. It's not antibodies. With, yeah, it's uh, just a reaction. To, it's an that's inhibition. That's incredible. Study. I wonder if there's any way, you know, we, we look at snake venom as a medicinal, um, has a medicinal component to human beings. I wonder if, much like crocodilians have such a uh, impressive immune system, I wonder if there's something in this snake's blood that we could look at and, and maybe find out, you know, how can humans use that or exploit that in the best sense of the word um, to be to combat venomous snake bites. I don't know if that's something that's even possible or is it, am I? Am yeah, that's interesting. I, Who knows? Know. Yeah, that's something. I don't know. Hey, you know what the fun thing about hanging out with Dr. Bogan here um, is this is, this is, and I say this in meaning the highest of praise. It is nerd out central here. We we are like, I mean, and it's fun to see Trevor guys, because this is like Trevor, this is kind of like, nerddom for you like this, this is, is like my third or fourth visit to the OCIC and every time there's always something new there's yeah. something progressing and it's really cool to see the work there's just a lot of science being done here yes. um to re and hyper focused on these animals which you don't often see that with a snake. You just don't often see the attention given to the to these snakes. And even the Orient Society gets its name. Uh, we were talking earlier um, uh, about a young girl who was passionate about these animals. Is that right? That's correct. And her name was Orianne. So that's where the, uh, the name originates. All right, so this is beautiful. Now, this is obviously a very sterile way that you're keeping the snakes. Um, and some people might look at this and say, oh, this is, you know, I, I know for me, my thing is habitats. I love to create habitats for my animals. This serves a function. Explain to people who may be lay people why this is okay for these snakes in this current situation. And perhaps we'll have a look at some of the things you're doing to mimic their more natural habitat. Yeah, so this is a, a good way to keep um, keep the cooties down. Got right? you. So, um, Easily disinfected, non-porous surface. We can um, exchange the, the newsprint uh, easily when it gets soiled. Indigo snakes have a very high metabolic rate. They are, you know, if this was a, um, a boa about this size, they might be eating once every two to three weeks, defecating once every two to three weeks. These guys are eating two to three times a week and they're wow. defecating two to three times a week. So in order to keep things clean, we did experiment some with these drawers and using a, um, coconut fiber or um, um, some straw, pine straw, okay. and it was just too hard to keep clean. Um, and we were having some um, dermatitis issues okay. in the snakes here. So this is um, just a clean way to go about. We're all going through uh, some health screening, so that helps us keep things uh, clean as well. But the whole goal is to have everybody, when I say everybody, I mean every snake, yep. housed outside. And we can see some of the outdoor units and what we're looking at cool. where the, the goal is to have them all uh, live. Cool, yeah. all right, so for such a big and active snake, you know, it's gonna be interesting. We were talking a little bit about um, just kind of their diet. I mean, so much, it, it's so exciting to talk to you because so much is going into um, the, the thought process of how we can make healthier snakes because the whole goal here is not just to keep the snakes here. The whole goal is to breed these snakes and then have them reintroduced into certain sites that have been approved for their release. That's correct. You know, our, our facility is the only facility that breeds the Eastern Indigo snake with the sole intention of releasing the offspring back into the wild. Yeah, so that's part of the reason why I got excited about, you know, helping this project because so many times, you know, funds are needed, um, not just for releasing the animals, but there's veterinary costs, there's habitat construction. Um, you know, all of these are very important, uh, you know, 
funds that have to be, you know, you, you're a nonprofit, so you're raising all this uh, from the ground up. That's correct. Yeah. So you know, in, in order to produce enough offspring, you have to have enough uh, breeding pairs. And, you know, so we have to have them kept close together. And whenever you have a population that is that's more dense, um, you increase the risk of possible uh, infectious disease spread. You go to the airport, how many times you come back from the airport and you got the sniffles? Yeah, exactly. Same type of thing. You got a dense population, stuff gets spread around. So, you know, help to try and mitigate that is why we, you know, try to keep this as uh, Spartan uh, as possible. Cool. We have actually done some studies looking at stress hormones, and um, we're, the researchers are still uh, computing the cortisol levels right now. But we we're comparing snakes that are kept in a drawer type setup like this compared to a, a vision cage like this compared to those that are housed outside. And we're actually looking, is there a difference between the cortisol levels or stress hormones? And we, you know, we don't have the numbers back yet, but it might be interesting to see, oh, it's all the same, or maybe the ones outside are more stressed even because yeah. a it, there's, flew overhead. Right, who knows, maybe. It's interesting we were talking about that and, and um, I would love to see the outdoor enclosures as well. I think you guys would, you know, just to see how a facility does it. It's interesting to see zoo setups but then a functional outdoor setup to where you have a similar situation where it's easy to clean, easy to manage. Yet, when we first met, we started chatting uh, this morning about uh, the previous director had the just, you know, almost a eureka moment where he's like, hey, we should be breeding these guys outside. Um, and it seems so uh, obvious, right? right. But uh, this is, you know, how many eggs have you produced so far this year? So far, we we have over 130 eggs incubated. Wow. That's incredible. And you guys get a shout out as well. Yeah. How many egg, fertile eggs did the uh, alligators? So produce? our female produced nine eggs. We believe three of them are fertile. So we're time will tell. Right? Yeah. It's so very cool. we're gonna so go, cross our fingers and hope for the best. Yeah. We don't count our eggs before exactly. they hatch, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting. Okay. So we have larger enclosures here, the vision cages, as you guys can see, um, and this is for some of the larger animals. Um, but you know, you know, amazing. I, it smells clean in here. That's for sure. You know, it's a very right. <laughs> it's a very great spot to be. So I guess we're going to go outside now. Let's look at the outdoor units. It's cool where these guys are all moving. This is awesome, man. And you just recently put in some new units. The, what we're looking at here are actually an older group of caging. Yeah, these ones here um, we were originally built uh, with pressure treated lumber and some PVC plywood. Uh, I say plywood in parentheses or quotes. And constantly re replacing the wood. And it got to a point where the, there was so much um, degradation to the wood that it, the integrity was not sound. And so gotcha. that, that's, they're being condemned and replaced. Okay. Um, and so again, all those funds, that's exactly why we raised the money because this stuff is not cheap. But look at this, look at this place, guys. Completely screened in from any kind of predators. I also like, um, the fact that you smart, you have little sunshade and when there's bad weather, your uh, keepers can actually stay out of the weather. Just little things, guys. But look at this. This is awesome. So let's see. So we have um, several units here. Okay. Let me take a look here at um, <laughs> Cassie's unit. This here is, uh, well, this is pretty creative here. We like creative on this channel. So, Leanne and one of our technicians here uh, developed this unit. Uh... And because of fear of any kind of contagion, we'll just let, you know, Dr. Bogan, he can either walk in if he'd like, uh, but just to show you guys how serious they take all of the biosecurity measures here. He's got his little booties there. Yeah, we're not going to want to spread any between the two enclosures. But so, a um, little bit art artistic uh, license here yeah. with Rhiannon's uh, enclosure, but this is a nice habitat for them. Um, we do have water bowl. Of course, it's empty right now, so it's not collecting rainwater because there's no snake in here currently. But simulating a gopher tortoise burrow here, gotcha. so it's a nice uh, area of refugia. We also have a, um, a small hole inside this uh, rock. This is actually a man made structure, and there's a, an ABS drain pipe that's going down counter buried in the ground into this. Yeah, I like this, cooler. this is really cool. It's an actual cooler, guys, so. This cooler is countersunk, and the drain comes into the side, and this is to serve or mimic a gopher tortoise burrow. 
Okay. And the other thing that was interesting to me um, in talking to you earlier was these are snakes that are endemic to this area. These are snakes that also encounter cold temperatures, legit cold, like sometimes in the 40s and 30s. Yet here at the center in central Florida, when you do hit those kind of temperatures, you have a threshold temperature where you actually pull the animals in during the winter. Yeah, we have the luxury. We have an indoor facility that's that's insulated and helps. it's regulated. And just to be on the safe side, uh, when, when temperatures in this region get below, you know, 50, just to be on the safe side, we bring them inside. Gotcha. But that's very few days in this latitude. Yeah, we've been very cold. lucky. But, you know, some of the more northerly ranges, I'm sure these animals are, are hibernating. But the thing that we need to remember, friends, is that even in nature, hibernation is a very stressful time. Um, Correct. You know, th these are wild animals. These are animals that are in the wild. If the animal didn't eat properly, you know, leading up to it going into brumation, it could die. Correct. Um, you and, know. and the temperatures in a lot of the gopher tortoise burrows up in the northern latitudes, I believe, don't get actually below 50. Even though the air temperature um, may be colder, uh -huh. the, the burrows will actually stay much warmer. Natural gopher tortoise burrow can be much deeper than, right. you know, this two and feet. And We're talking difference of sometimes, I mean, that's two feet, like you said. Gopher tortoise burrows can go 20 foot easy. Yeah. Um, and so the reason gopher tortoise do that is because here in the Southeast, we have extreme temperatures, extremely hot in the summer, and we can also get into those cold temperatures. So the burrow, being that it's subterranean, uh, it's just insulated by the ground, more consistent. And other animals like indigo snakes and burrowing owls and even rattlesnakes will use uh, their burrows. So how often in the wild um, are you finding indigo to go snakes uh, in gopher tortoise burrows? It's quite common in the winter months. In the summer months, up in the northern latitudes, not too often in the summer months. In the summertime, it's been shown they actually go to um, wetlands down to the swampy area, the grocery store, basically. Ah, for them. Okay. And in the, <laughs> in the winter time, they come up to the Zurich Highlands, and that's where the gopher tortoise burrows are. And there is some site fidelity. They tend to go back to the same burrow year after year. Wow and they call that home. That's their winter home. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, again, because these animals have that site fidelity, new word I, I learned today, uh, new term rather. Um, basically, you know, there's some thought. Uh, how do you go about reintroducing these animals? I know you had, there's some criteria. There's only two places in the country at the moment where you can release uh, or repatriate these animals. Yeah. So. You know, there's there's two locations, and you know, we're part of a um, committee that helps determine where the indigos go and how we're reintroducing them. And, and it's several uh, government agencies as well as non-government organizations, uh, universities, and um, and zoo facilities. And we've selected criteria that you have to have several thousand acres of established longleaf pine ecosystem that is undergoing a regular prescribed burn. What does the prescribed burn have to do with it? So the suppression of fire will degrade the ecosystem. You know, in, before Europeans settled the area, the longleaf pine gets struck by lightning and there'd be burns on a regular basis, you know, yearly, every other year, every three years, what have you. And that helps a lot of the invasive plants uh, stay down. Okay. Um, it tends to promote the a grassy savanna with a um, longleaf pine canopy. Longleaf pine is a species of pine that is resistant to fire, but they tend not to grow very dense. And so you have this lo loose canopy and it allows for gopher tortoises to <clears throat> forage and move around. When fire has been suppressed, you get a lot of more kind of a thicket and um, a, a dense underbrush and the tortoises can't move around. If there's no tortoise, there's no burrow, there's no burrow, there's no indigo snake. And that's what you're trying to mimic here. We've got the pine straw on the ground here. We got some branches because these animals will take to uh, climbing from time to time. Uh, uh, they are a yeah, few It tends to be individualistic. Some, okay. indivi some snakes, you know, personality wise, they prefer to stay on the ground. They may not really get elevated too often. And others, they're always in the trees. I can't get them out. That's so funny. Yeah, it's interesting. Some are afraid of heights, some not. But <laughs> each one of these and each one of your keepers kind of gets the opportunity to create a habitat. Is that what's going on here? Yeah, so you know, um, our, our larger models here were um, 
the design. And if those of you who follow us on our social media may have seen our- What is the social media? Shout it out. And we'll have that in the description below as well. Oh, come on. <laughs> He's too busy doing looking up snake cloacas here. Well, Follow the Central Florida Zoo or the Orient Center for Indigo Snake Colony. There you go. All right. Very cool, guys. All right. Edit that out. <laughs> Don't worry. We might keep it. It's kind of funny. But um, all right. Very cool. So each one of these has a different kind of almost, you know, theme. We have smaller enclosures here. Um, so it's very interesting stuff to see how snake scientists keep the animals when it is time for them to actually be uh, put out into an outdoor enclosure. And then obviously the hopes here are that you can release uh, their offspring. All of the, uh, oh, look at this. We have a little tree frog hanging out right there. Thanks. A little nature, nature hanging around. Um, well, you know, each of these is as biosecure as possible, but that just shows a perfect point what you're dealing with. You have a little, a little frog, okay? That frog can go between each one of these. You know, they could potentially spread disease. That's why it's a never-ending... Never-ending battle. Uh, right. Yeah, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, sleepless nights and ang anxiety for you being a veterinarian, like, oh, God. Never it, know. Yep. Yeah, it, especially when you're dealing with an endangered species. There's an acceptable level of tolerance, what we're going to accept, you know, and... and we think the benefits of being housed outside, getting natural sunlight, mm -hmm. getting the barometric pressure and the rains and the and the gradual change in the photo period, we believe that is far outweighs the potential risk of some of the vector spread diseases through insects or anurins or small little anoles, what have yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And now another thing I wanna bug you about or pick your brain, because we did do a little conversing prior to the video rolling. You'll notice over here, guys, there's some circular uh, fish hatchery uh, tubs. Now, you're, I always say that true scientists are really detectives. And when you're working with animals, there's no, it's always evolving, all right? Your husbandry is always evolving. Now, you mentioned that the indigo snake, this animal is very active. And in the wild, how many acres will one indigo snake travel through? Yeah, depending on the location, anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand acres they'll claim as their hunting ground. And so, you know, even with a uh, outdoor unit that may be, you know, 80 square feet, it um, doesn't mimic acres, yeah. right? And so they don't get the exercise they would if they were in the wild. Um, we also feed them what's convenient, and that is, um, you know, thawed frozen prey items that's commonly used in, in the reptile uh, husbandry sections or right mm -hmm. keeping. So, you know, you got mice and rats and we'll do quail chicks and chicken chicks. We even use uh, rainbow trout and we'll use frog legs to try to vary it up. Uh, the problem is all of those food items, with exception maybe the frog legs, have um, very high fat content. And indigo snakes in the wild, stomach contents from indigo snakes in the wild have been shown to have a much lower fat content and a higher ash or non-digestible content. So basically all of our indigo snakes here and most snakes in captivity are couch potatoes eating cheeseburgers. Right? Yeah, exactly. So we do see about um, a 30% incidence rate of uh, dystocia or egg binding. Okay. Um, so, and it's nine, I think it's 9.23 times more prevalent in nulliparous females or, or first time moms. Um, exper than experienced moms. And so egg binding is, is, is pretty high. And it, the, the working um, theory on that right now, or hypothesis, is that they're just um, under condition or they're, you know, they're, they're couch potatoes. Which leads us to this. Uh, this is something that you've implemented. Yeah, so we're, we're <clears throat> getting, so some of the funding will help um, complete these structures. The idea is we're gonna build outdoor units that are uh, round in shape. And so we're using these as the base. And then we're going to, um, of course, finish building these up. If there's no corner, the uh, snake will be less likely to stop moving. Okay. And so the idea is to let them keep uh, moving right around and help uh, build their muscle strength. It's like a snake treadmill. Like yeah. Hamster yeah. Wheel. yeah, pretty <laughs> much a big hamster wheel. Yeah, interesting. And then perhaps, you know, maybe one day we can get some more funding and we can build like a large uh, curved, you know, enclosure outdoors um, that's it basically is like a run. 
for snakes. Does that make sense? Like where you can, uh, like how you section off certain snakes, maybe certain snakes can use it to run for a couple hours a day. Or I don't know if that's even yeah, feasible. Yeah, that's something, you know, it goes through our head. You know, we have to keep, obviously we can't put them out there together. That's just breeding season. They'll be together, but it's always chaperoned when that happens. Okay. Um, Cause again, Ophiophagus, we don't, they're, they're housed individual. If we get too big of enclosure, then you start running out of space. Like, all right, if you have a hundred snakes, yeah. how many big enclosures can you have? Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. There's so much to think of. It's actually boggling and it, it makes me, yeah, I thought I had a lot to worry about at home. The stakes are very high because these are animals that need the help and need human intervention in this regard because uh, habitat degradation, uh, indiscriminate killing just for the fact that it's a snake. Uh, and you know, I, I think all snakes are good, but this is truly one of the good snakes because it does eat venomous snakes. It's keeping down other populations of snakes that you, know, you necessarily, uh, I know a lot of people don't wanna run into venomous snakes often, but this is a snake that actually can handle those. Um, what are some other problems that this animal is facing in the wild that, that we need to be aware of? You touched on the big ones, you know, okay. habitat loss, habitat degradation, habitat fragmentation. You know, if you are claiming a few thousand acres as hunting ground, it's kind of hard to find a few thousand acres with a road going through it. Right. You know, and snake versus car, you know who wins that battle. Always. Yeah, right? sadly. Um, in fact, most of the animals that you get here, so certain animals come to you because their habitat's been fragmented and FWC finds them and brings them to you guys. Yep. We have had some uh, from there. And of course, FWC goes through a lo uh, process. There's a lot behind it. And I don't have all of the answers or, or all the computations that they use, but you know, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul because, you know, you don't want to decimate an area right. to try to re-supply uh, another area. So um, and that's their whole department. And gotcha. So their there's they, they obviously have criteria. Uh, perhaps, you know, if they find an animal that's uh, in need, they just call you guys Correct. up because you are licensed to house these. These are federally protected species. So this is, you know, federal uh, project uh, within the government's their protections. But um, listen, this is insanely uh, big undertaking. And yeah. um, I'm really glad that, you know, I could do a small part to help you out. I know Trevor yeah. is really passionate about this as well. And uh, the St. Augustine Alligator <laughs> Farm, you know, hats off to them uh, for really doing conservation work and putting the money where it is needed. Um, so again, uh, where are, you know, the overall scope of this place, <clears throat> it's vast. How many acres are you on here? 26. 26 acres, and I'll tell you what, it's pretty idyllic. They got a nice pond out there. It's a beautiful ride into it. Um, you guys are not open to the public, but you're open via tour. Uh, how does that work? So, you know, um, usually with educational programs, gotcha. um, there can be, uh, you, can, you can, you know, you visit the centralfordazoo.org slash OCIC. There, you can get more information about potential um, private Events. And then finally, just because so many people are interested in jobs with animals, how did you get started? How did you become the director of this uh, facility? Or, you know, in a nutshell, like what was it? Did you always love reptiles? Yeah, I've actually always loved reptiles. I had reptiles as pets when I was young. Um, you know, so I, I started, I was working for the Central Florida Zoo as the veterinarian. And uh, when the Central Florida Zoo took over, um, management of this facility, it just just dovetailed right in. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you today, Doctor. Meeting you too. Dr. Bogan. And hey, it's Jeff. always fun hanging yes. out with you. So I just, I'm really glad. Uh, now you guys know the money has gone to a good spot. So proud of what we've done. Proud of you guys. Thank you so much for helping us out. And uh, we'll see you again. I'm sure we'll be doing more uh, really we'll interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll be doing some more fun stuff. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Thank Let me know what much. you thought. Appreciate My pleasure. It. All right, guys. Take care.